let us begin the event uh, okay so let us uh, formally begin today's talk uh, thank you shukhendu uh, for that lovely prep up and uh, it is really a matter of you know immense uh, pleasure and honor that we are hosting a talk by dr daniel rugo uh, before i formally introduce him uh, and uh, you know base uh, a few comments on you know what his talk is going to be on uh, let me formally thank the administration of bakura university uh, our honorable vice chancellor sir professor devnarayan bondopadhyay who is the main must uh, the main man behind uh, all our initiatives uh, i would also like to thank our honorable register sir who not only supports us in every particular event but also finds out time from his extremely busy schedule to join us and uh, support us uh, through and through and we also uh, put in uh, a, a small round of thanks for our Uh, honorable dean sir uh, for his efforts in making these programs successful having said that uh, let me uh, formally introduce dr daniel rugo to you uh, dr rugo is an award winning filmmaker and a scholar his interests and specializations are diverse and varied he works on the lines of documentary and conflict uh, world cinema and film philosophy his film oeuvre is diverse uh, landscape environment and politics and especially political and civil violence uh, are evidenced from uh, his works his, his filmic versions uh, and portrayals and in particular these may be evidenced from his 2018 film perhaps his latest work about a war which has won many an accolade he has been widely published also by the likes of bloomsbury the journal of british academy oxford university press and edinburgh university press to name a few now uh, his talk is going to be on jalu nancy uh, and it is wonderfully titled jalu nancy thoughts to begin with and uh, all of us know or many of us who are uh, foraying into philosophy and metaphysics especially western philosophy we would be knowing that nancy has had a tremendous influence uh, on contemporary thought uh, given his you know preoccupations with uh, almost all major philosophers and thinkers like hegel lacan kant descartes and of course heidegger Uh, i wouldn't prolong this any further uh, before uh, i hand over the forum to dr rugo i would uh, request shukendu to uh, you know put in a few words uh, in favor of our honorable register sir if he is there i would request our honorable register sir to share his thoughts on this event dr shorob datto yeah uh, good evening uh, my colleagues ashukhendu uh, dash and dr shubhadeep pal uh, and obviously a uh, warm welcome to uh, dr daniel rigo uh, actually it's to be very frank it's an honor for all of us the family of bakura university to get this opportunity to listen to dr rugo and uh, i was very uh, curiously uh, listening to my colleague dr shubhadeep pal a few seconds ago when he was uh, talking about dr rugo so definitely it's it's a great opportunity for our university uh, for your kind information uh, dr rigo bakura university is uh, a small university in comparison with many big universities but one thing 
we can assure you as the registrar of this university that there is no lack of sincerity, no lack of commitment, no lack of dedication uh, by the officials. Whenever I'm telling officials, I'm including, of course, the professors, the teachers. So there is no lack of uh, the level of sincerity and uh, commitment. And always uh, we are eager to do something innovative, to do something out of the box, to do something uh, special for the learners. Of course, we also uh, always uh, consider ourselves to be the learners because there is no end of learning. I firmly believe that uh, every day we are learning. So this initiative by the center of, uh, I mean, Center for Research in Post-Humanities Bakura University, this initiative to uh, invite uh, uh, some uh, uh, excellent speakers, excellent experts like you uh, in front of all of us, uh, maybe through virtual platform, but it's a tremendous opportunity for all concerned to get uh, uh, enriched by such speeches. And one thing I want to mention that this is already in the process of being recorded. So definitely I can, I can say that uh, this, this speech uh, going to be delivered by Dr. Daniele Rugo would be kept in the repository or rather to, would be kept as the repository of Bakur University so that <coughs> in future it can be used as and when required. So this is really going to be an asset for the Bakura University. So I will not say uh, much. It's, it's an evening time for us, uh, for a few of us, the working uh, day or working hour is yet to over. So uh, amidst our schedule of uh, work, uh, it's, it's a kind of fantastic feeling that I also uh, being one of the uh, being one of the uh, uh, patrons uh, I just uh, I mean being being one of the guests uh, I also got this opportunity to say something about this so it's an honor to me so without saying much uh, I I want to say that Dr. Daniele Rigo wherever you stay uh, uh, Please treat us, uh, members of Bakura University, as the great well-wishers for, uh, for all of, I mean, for you. And to be very frank, you just uh, keep in mind that uh, not only for your professional career, not only for your research career, but even for your family life, we want very best in the coming days. So you treat ourselves as your big well-wishers, because now you are also part of the uh, Bakura University family in some way. So definitely, uh, thank you. And I express my uh, gratefulness uh, that you have come. Uh, just you have accepted our invitation and, and accordingly we're going to deliver. So uh, best of luck for this event. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much from uh, this end. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dotto, for that uh, lovely you know, introductory and those uh, kind and warm words that always reverberate in our hearts uh, and inspire us to carry forward. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I would like to virtually invite Dr. Daniel Rugo uh, to come forth and make your presentation. Uh, Dr. Rigo, the virtual platform is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone. I wish to extend my thanks to all parties involved, um, in particular to Shukandu, who has um, started a correspondence with me in the first place and was also agreed uh, with the help, I'm sure, from the colleagues to postpone this talk, which was originally planned to take place last week. It is my great pleasure and the honor to be able to speak to this audience today. Of course, I wish I was there in person and we could make a more uh, personal acquaintance, but digital technologies do allow us to cross great uh, distances. And so 
it is a pleasure for me to be able to deliver a talk while sitting in my office in London. It's very, very cold out, out there today, but it's, it's so very sunny. Um, my talk um, will last almost almost an hour. Please do do let me know if I go over the time that I am that I've been assigned. Um, any, no, no. We, we don't it, have any time constraint. Uh, okay. It's, it, it is it is good for, for my for myself to keep time because I might go over them by too long. So I will do I will keep time for myself. Um, the 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 topic is um, the thought or the thinking of Jean Luc Nancy. I've titled these thoughts to begin with because I wanted to not introduce the work of Jean Luc Nancy, which probably does not need introduction to these audience, but at least to give a sense of where I think the significance of Jean-Luc Nancy's thought for Western philosophy, contemporary Western philosophy, can say, can say to rest, and how we can get a sense of what thinking practice as Nancy tried to bequeath us and bequeaths to us what is his legacy, given that we're also talking here, and this is the first time really I do so in memoriam, so because of Jean-Luc's uh, passing, recent passing. I have had the privilege of meeting Jean-Luc Nancy uh, and of corresponding with him for a number of years. My first meeting with uh, Jean-Luc Nancy dates back to 2005, when I was a PhD student and he came to London for a talk invited by my then supervisor. And after the talk, we had a very pleasant dinner together. And from then, uh, we started exchanging uh, emails every now and then. And as our correspondence continued, um, Jean-Luc agreed very kindly to write a foreword for a book that I was fin completing on his work and on that of Stanley Cavell, um, which was then... Uh, which was then published by Palgrave. We exchanged a number of emails uh, after the foreword was written. It was a wonderful text, as, as I was expecting. And one day I was walking around London and I saw a graffiti, a muralis, a graffiti on the wall, and I took a picture of that graffiti. The graffiti read, let's adore and endure each other. Show to the camera. This was the graffiti in question. And I thought that this was something that Jean-Luc would find interesting, given that, of course, he had published not long before a book by the title Adoration, Adoration, The Construction of Christianity, number two, the second volume, The Construction of Christianity. So I took the picture and sent it to him. And he responded very quickly um, to my email saying, this was his response, too much. That is exactly the truth. This answer is the thought that I begin to that I like to begin with today. Um, there is in in Nancy's work an almost exact coincidence between the question of the excess of sense and the question of truth. And in a way, one could say that Nancy gets to the question of truth via the excess of sense. And I'm going to essentially spend the next fifty or so minutes trying to unpack um, how we can articulate more fully this very basic idea, this very basic coincidence. There is an absolute realism in Jean-Luc Nancy, something that uh, Jacques Derrida also remarked, accompanied by the sense that this realism is also always excessive. This is why for Nancy, thinking always begins again and begins as a form of thanking, of giving thanks. When speaking about Nancy's absolute realism, this is Derrida as in mind as he writes the open quote, the thing touches itself, is touched, even, where, even there where one touches nothing, close quote. The absolute realism that you confront without mastery call it evidence, that calls us to vigilance and attention is nothing else than the world itself. Jean-Luc Nancy wrote a very, uh, by now, well-known work uh, called The Sense of the World, Le Sens du Monde, um, in which 
the notion of the world becomes crucial and will remain crucial throughout his later philosophical thinking. So it is the question of the world and of the sense of the world that I will address my thoughts now. So one of the key questions that Nancy's philosophy, philosophy asks is, what gesture does the world call us to? What kind of thinking, what philosophical gesture does the world call us to? Now, C's book that I've just mentioned, Adoration, opens itself up precisely to this question. When we come across an evidence, we encounter nothing new, no new signification. And so we call evidence that which exhausts itself in its presentation, that which is not referable to any outside and yet produces a movement of sense, a commotion of sense. We can all see the evidence, we cannot avoid it, it flashes in front of us, and yet it arrests us only if we pay attention to it. Only in this moment of attention, in this arrest, do we start articulating, picking up the shaking that an evidence produces. Evidence does not bring something forward, does not let a particular object or person stand in front of us more clearly. It rather reduces the object to something that cannot be grasped, not assimilated. If this seems to carry a discourse beyond reason, and one could say that which is beyond reason perhaps is also beyond philosophy, for Nancy, going beyond reason is always a matter of picking up what reason has left behind, reason's self-repression, auto-censor, uh, auto-censorship. To speak of the world as evidence, is to, is to open up reason to what commands it and to what makes it work. Nancy's attempt to pay the world its due by leaving vacant the place hollowed out by God's departure is such a gesture. Of course, Nancy picks up philosophy from the moment, uh, as we all be Western philosophy from the place where God has the, the, the principle that animates the philosophical quest as kind of been vacated, has been has departed. It is reason itself that demands its own overcoming, that thinks there's something, there's something that cannot be thought. And at the same time, it thinks it all the time, every day, by thinking and gesturing towards the uncomfortable resistance of the singular to its own models of reduction. Yet reason cannot grant itself the right to think that which cannot be reduced. This is what essentially Nancy challenges by collecting and relaunching the problem of modernity. For modernity is the name for the absence of accountable givens, starting, of course, with God. Modernity is that which gets rid of accountable givens. But what becomes apparent is, open quote, that the empty place must not be occupied. All the relativisms, skepticisms, logicism, all duly atheist, will have been attempts, more or less pitiful or frightening, to occupy this place. So once philosophy, in a sense, um, in a metaphorical sense, gets rid of God, uh, there's, there's a vacant place, and Nancy says this vacant place should not be filled with something else, with another principle, with a stand-in for what was the divine. To leave the place of the givens empty means for us, first of all, not to substitute God with reason. Once reason is assigned with the task that was once God, establishing a foundation for the world, guaranteeing once and for all the sense of this world, that is simply replicated gesture, accountability of origins and the completion of sense. However, reason proves itself to be unsatisfied with this. And, and here does see probably as in mind the whole epistemological battle that Descartes and others following Descartes engages in finding that one object which would prove the, re the existence of the world, in finding that piece of knowledge that would prove to us that the world really exists and it's not our, our own dream or projection. Not only reason once more, but, but, but once more than anything that can be given to it or that it can fabricate out of the given. The gesture required by the world's evidence is precisely one that allows reason to relate to this desire, not in order to settle it, but in order to let it play. If the skeptical conclusion is a natural impulse, 
as say Stanley Cavell would say, that what nurtures these impulses, reasons relation to sense as that which cannot be concluded, is what is repressed in that conclusion. The epistemologist gathers its evidence and declares knowledge to be an overall failure, meaning there is there isn't one object that can prove that the world exists. What Nancy responds to this and asks us to think is what if the nothing that the epistemology has discovered is actually the answer? And there's no nihilism here, quite the opposite. That the world is not a thing, not something reason can enclose, but the very unconditioned that drives reason to enclose itself, to give an account of everything. Thus, the gesture called fall by this evidence is a way of accepting the excess of determined significations that the world is. In other words, reason searches for that object which proves that the world is an object among others and that can be held by reason, whilst not accepting that the world is rather that which open reason up to whatever quest it engages with. To say it otherwise, experience, the singular existence and its constant exposure to other singularities is not something that can be reduced, for it is itself the excess that makes us want to speak, to listen, to move, to love, to adore. What if then the fortuity of the world's existence, the fact that it just exists, which includes, of course, our contingency, the gift of this chance encounter, this sudden thought, and unnamed strangeness, could become the very resource of reason rather than its curse? What if the thing that we, f we fear, the fact that reason cannot find that object that proves the existence of something, could actually be a resource rather than, than, than a problem? What if this was precisely the task of thinking, not to recover a lost intimacy towards an ultimate truth of sense, but to affirm the force that draws us towards the world and behind which there is nothing. What there is is that we're fascinated by existence. We're fascinated, we're attracted by existence, by our own. We're wanting to live, as it were. Essentially, then, this gesture does not move beyond reason, neither does it try to lower the bar as to what reason can do. Quite the opposite. Confronting the strangeness of the world, reason opens itself up to it. Now, C writes that reason knows that, open quote, giving a reason goes beyond any reason that can be given. It knows that giving one's reason is an interminable process. So reason intimately knows that what it wants is the more that it can obtain, not by finding an object that stands in for the world, but by opening it itself up to the world. A longing for the unconditioned can turn from the desire to be freed of every conditioning into the patience to bear the condition of the world. And this is for me the key, say, inheritance of Nancy, among many others, but among Nancy, from Nancy to uh, Nancy has in relation to Heidegger. The idea that a longing to be completely freed and in a condition that where reason can have it all can actually be turned into the patience to bear the condition of being alive in this very world. And I will qualify what I mean by patience in a little in a little while. Now, this is exactly the gesture that Heidegger describes as vigilance. In this picture, in Heidegger's picture, man, open quote, acknowledges the concealedness of what is and the insusceptibility of the latter's presencing or absenting to any decision. The invitation here is for reason to unfurl in accordance to the excess of assignation that it witnesses in the world, submitting itself to this excess, that the world cannot be understood as an object among many and cannot be understood as an object, full stop. Reason becomes unconditioned in as much as it is conditioned by the unconditioned. And I, I'm sorry if, if here the language gets contorted. 
In both texts, when this reversal emerges in Heidegger, Parmenides is, is a Parmenides fragment, Parmenides a Greek philosopher, that serves as a starting point. The fragment reads in, in ancient Greek, to know and to be the same. In Heidegger's text, The Age of the World Picture, the German philosopher writes that the world, that which is, come upon the one who himself opens himself. As a consequence, reason is not the instrument that pictures the world and makes the world into an object, but that which is regarded by it and opens to this excess. So instead of here having a reason that is all-encompassing, that can explain the whole world, reason opens itself up to this fact that it cannot explain the whole world. It cannot finish off with sense. Heidegger writes, open quote, man is the man as in humanity, is the one who is looked upon by that which is. He is the one who is in company with itself, gathered towards presencing by that which opens itself. To be beheld by what is, to be included and maintained within its openness, and in that way to be born driven about by its oppositions and marked by its discord. That is the essence of man. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a sense in, in Heidegger also that man is led by and to the world, as opposed to enclosing the world within thinking, within thought, within, uh, within reason. The same Parmenides fragment appears also in Heidegger text, what is called thinking. Here Heidegger affirms man's inability to think as a condition proper to man's history. This inability to think that Heidegger identifies is not, however, simply a defect, but depends on our turning away from what provokes us to thinking in the first place thoughts to begin with. What begins our thinking, what provokes, what set, set us up to think, what produces our thinking in the first place. Heidegger says that the reason why we're unable to think is because we have turned away from what provokes us to thinking for what triggers our, our thinking. Learning to think, Heidegger continues, is a matter of turning towards what provokes, not an attraction that one seeks, but a push that one suffers, and at the same time through which one is activated. So there's a passive element here, to a certain extent, in Heidegger's idea of thinking. To be drawn, to let oneself be turned by thinking, would then constitute a revolution in the sense of an unlearning of our, of our ways of thinking, which are dominated according to Heidegger by what he calls making, a condition that crushes thought. And it crushes thought because for Heidegger, making has to do with manipulating, simply manipulating and grasping and beholding, clutching objects. Our task is thus, first of all, to be attentive to the appeal, open ourselves up to what attracts us. Heidegger refers to this most often as listening closely and letting ourselves become involved, but also as losing ourselves, delivering ourselves from revenge, opening to the most apparent, being commanded, attending to, and finally, acknowledging and thanking. These two terms designate two stages of a preparation to thinking, one that ultimately delivers us to the heart of thinking, to think is to take things to heart. The question of acknowledgement emerges in Heidegger's text in the midst of the discussion of the unthought. We're reading the Western tradition. We're constantly blocked in our attempts to understand what the tradition says by the view that tradition is behind us. That what we're having to read is Heidegger says, in the past, in any way that therefore we throw a kind of historical eye on it, meaning we look at it as having been already surpassed 
by the next wave of thinking. So Heidegger says we read the Greeks as if we had already moved beyond them, that we had left them behind. We read Pomenides, Plato, Aristotle as if they were behind us, part only of our history, part of our heritage. Heidegger asks instead that we think of our tradition as something we stand in the midst of, almost held captive by it. The importance, that's, the importance then of a gesture that allows us to connect with the language of the thinkers essentially puts, puts in play our future rather than our past. Heidegger says rather than thinking of tradition as the, something that is in the past and something that we uh, look at as if we were, as if it was surpassed, we should look at it as being decisive for our future. Because for Heidegger, the tradition obviously has produced certain habits of thinking, certain habits of reason. And unless we can see them, uh, or rather the way we look at them, we'll produce our future, we'll, we'll mark our future. And a connection with this language, with the language of the thinkers, is thus possible only through acknowledgement. Acknowledgement liberates the inexhaustible singularity of a thinker's language. It is always something unique that we need to prepare ourselves for. It is not this inexhaustible singularity, this incomprehensible, in the, say, in the Greeks. The incomprehensible is only what we refuse to accept in our assumption that we already understood everything. So Heidegger says it's not that the Greeks speak in a different language that makes it difficult for us to read their fragments. It's the fact that we think we have already understood them, the the way of our acknowledgement of what they say, of understanding them again in their own terms, as it were. Instead of stopping under the pressure exercised by the inexhaustible to scrutinize our power of comprehension, we bypass it and say, it must be so. Another philosopher almost at the same time as this, highlights perhaps something similar in his invitation in matter of games to look and see rather than assuming something to be the case. In the philosophical investigation, in the investigation number 60, Victor Schwein writes, open quote, don't think, but look, close quote. We're thinking as the sense of an unshakable conviction already assured of its conclusion. If you think, I visited, they said, you are replicating a habit. So don't think, but look what is in front of you, as you were. Look how the game unfolds. Let yourself be attracted by it. In both cases, Victor Stein and Heidegger, one faces an appeal to turn around our ways of thinking, or to turn our ways of thinking around. Heidegger calls acknowledgement the readiness to let our own attempts at thinking be overturned again and again. So it is about understanding thinking anew, to begin with thinking again. The opposite of this readiness is obstinacy. We can't ignore this obstinacy precisely because we trigger it without being aware of it. We inhabit obstinacy, as you were. The conversion Heidegger demands is such that it brings us outside of our obstinacies and forces us to open ourselves to what attracts us. In Heidegger's words, this is expressed as the need to reconfigure thinking, not as emanating from man's mastery of the world or of being, but the other way around. So we start thinking not where we try to master the world or master being, but the other way around, where we allow being to master thinking, to master us. Heidegger writes, open quote, every way of thinking takes its way already within the total relation of being and man's nature, or else it is not thinking at all. To come close to this overturning, to prepare oneself for it, one needs, first of all, to learn respecting and acknowledging. Acknowledgement runs counter to obstinacy and as such is run counter to thinking as forming. Thinking as the formation of ideas reinforces our obstinacy since it opposes what is the world. 
in this sense, thinking becomes violent, since it is essentially pursuing where the drift between man and what is, man and the world, grows bigger. We do not respond to what provokes us to thinking. We anesthetize the provocation, we silence the provocation, and therefore neglect and pass by what is most attractive. In Zarathustra, Nietzsche speaks of ver this very same thing as revenge, open quote, the spirit of revenge that, my friends, has been up to now humanity's best reflection, close quote. Whilst Ralph Waldo Emerson, the American philosopher, invokes it as, open quote, their most unhandsome, not handsome, part of our condition, close quote. Heidegger reads Nietzsche's idea of punishment as hostility that calls itself justice. Hostility becomes right and thinking become, open quote, the sphere of representational ideas, which basically pursue and set upon everything that comes and goes and exists in order to depose, reduce it, and decompose it. So Heidegger says how thinking is geared towards essentially analyzing the object at stake to the point of decomposing it, to the point of destroying it. So instead of giving thanks, as it were, acknowledging the world, we reduce it to nothing. Deliverance from this way of thinking is not the abandonment of thinking, but abandonment to thinking, to what calls us and commands us to thinking, and as a consequence puts us in question, but also sets us in motion and trusts us, assigns us to sense. So for Heidegger, it's not about moving beyond thinking and say, okay, let's stop thinking, let's do something else. Maybe running, maybe eating, uh, maybe sunbathing. For Heidegger, it is about abandoning oneself to what attracts us and therefore sets us in motion to thinking and therefore allows us to think. And if the world is excessive, if the sense of the world can be cannot be fully explained, completely enclosed in reason, this is what we need to abandon ourselves to. Thinking is a calling, not in the sense of a vocation, but in the sense of a gift. This gift gives nothing, not an object, but a movement, a direction, an attraction, an invitation, a tension that is not yet in tension. We become capable of thinking for Heidegger only once we allow ourselves to be stepped into this tension, to be brought into this tension. The logic that is reversed from thinking as construction, synthesis, making, formation, affecting, to thinking as tension received and articulated and responded to. I do give this articulation thanking, giving thanks. Heidegger's transformation of thinking into thanking allows him to provide a force to counteract the obstinacy of our logical rational representations. In the word thanks, Heidegger hears this, open quote, the inclination with which the inmost meditation of the heart turns toward, towards all that is in being the inclination that is not within its own control. is an inclination that in a sense uh, exceeds our even willingness to think. Thinking has to be heartfelt and inclined towards that which it is not and cannot become its own. The heart thinks when through it we feel beholden, we become devoted to the gift that gives, nothing but attraction. In thinking, we give thanks from the heart. As a consequence, thinking will attest our nature as dependent and related. This dependency and this uh, relationality can be understood in two senses. We are dependent in as much as our thinking should become attention towards what invites us to be beholden, what moves us by commanding us. But we are also dependent because in thinking, we give ourselves completely, or as one could say, wholeheartedly. It is not a matter of passivity, but of passion. We leap into thinking and we settle down there once we abandon ourselves completely to the heart of things, to the outside that draws us towards 
interest and rushes us into the midst of sense. This letting go that allows us by each of us, it is up to us alone. In this sense, philosophy is of no help because philosophy itself, according to what Heidegger has told us, has to learn what thinking is. Heidegger even urges us, and if there are more students here, uh, don't take up his suggestion, but he urges us to burn our lecture notes, the sooner the better, close quote. Heidegger specifies then what thinking is not. It is not knowledge in the sense in which science is knowledge. It is not wisdom in the sense of a, a ready-made uh, set of advice, uh, suggestions for well, for good living. It does not solve ultimate as in metaphysical question. It does not directly empower our actions. Heidegger, however, is not reducing or limiting the opportunities, the possibility and the responsibilities of thinking. Quite the opposite. The world lays claim to us and these demands can be heard only once we become devoted to the evident, which we fail to see and nonetheless want to control. And of course, this double command, devotion to what's before us, follows from Heidegger's interpretation of mentioned before, in particular for those who are interested in the more philological aspects here, rests on his reading of the two Greek verb legain and noain. The evidence, however, is not the consequence of our doing. It is not our formation. This is what we require conversion from. Heidegger writes, open quote, that we imagine that the, co the curse, sorry, that we imagine that the course of the world can be controlled within with routine. And this is what we need to turn away from, to think that we can control the world through a mechanism, as it were, even a thinking mechanism or a philosophical mechanism. Becoming devoted does, we take something up specifically and we take it to heart. But taking things to heart means to leave what we take exactly as it is. It is a keeping that does not possess anything. Taking up is a receiving. I have elsewhere called this a power of patience. Wanted to hear in this expression the possibility to maintain the tension towards what comes, to make this tension inexhaustible, and through this assuring that what comes cannot be consumed. A power of patience means to keep oneself into the tension, into the calling, into the attraction of the world. So to have the power to maintain oneself there and not to consume it, not to want to exhaust it completely. Thinking does not begin with doubt. This is, uh, in a way, Descartes' idea, but with patience. Attention that is not the prudency of wisdom or cautiousness of wisdom, but the conduct of the one who joyfully lets oneself be carried into the world again and again. Patience is wanting more of what has first summoned, moved and attracted us. It is a power to endure the force of what comes, to receive it not in order to absorb it or to counter it, but so that by that force, we can respond again and again and respond with a more, more. Or rather, as Don C wrote back to me, too much, exactly the truth. Patience is the power of the one who wants the call not to be exhausted in its reception. The one who does not want to be left in peace. The one who also does not want to be done with the world. It resounds equally with passion and appetite. And of course, the word patience, the English word patience, um, is the, quite directly related to the word patsos, the Greek word patsos. And of course, the word patience, which indicate also an ability to be sensitive to something, uh, to be susceptible of something, to be receptive, in a way. There's more reception than there is action in the idea of, uh, of passion and patience. It resounds equally with passion and appetite as it does with attentiveness and responsiveness. It is ultimately the tension 
for that which has no end, the taking up of the end of all ends. The idea that we should get rid of ultimate uh, fire, teleological uh, explanations. Only can be patient the one who wants more. As Heidegger writes, open quote, letting things lie before us is necessary to supply us with what lies thus before us can be taken to heart. So taking to heart is itself letting things be, allowing what comes to exercise its attraction, its evidence. This is our conversion. This is also philosophy's essential distraction. Essentially in the sense that without this, philosophy closes upon itself, clutching the world in its fist to find out that there's nothing there. Thinking is taking things to heart. The installing of man, of humanity, back into the openness of sense, to which he is equally passable, to which we are equally passable and responsible. This is what it means to be sensitive to the sense of the world, which is something that definitely Jean-Luc Nancy was, and reminded everybody that we should be. This is what it means to be sensitive to the sense of the world. And what else is thinking, if not the ability to be sensitive to the sense of the world? And by sense of the world, I mean here absolutely everything from a patch of color in a painting to the idea of the potential existence of the divine through the passage of light to a small speckle to a corporeal experience and so on and so forth. Thinking is being sensitive to the sense of the world, being patient to the sense of the world. Our access to the world then is patience exercised with and not against its force, the force of the world. This force is both what trusts before ourselves, call it our interest in the world, and open quote, sends us far beyond ourselves. And this is from Jean-Luc Nancy's adoration. Call it our continual transformation of ourselves. So, the force of the world is what thrusts us from afar before ourselves, before our intention, before our constitution, constitution as subjectivities, as willing subjectivities. So our interest in the world before we know necessarily what we want from it, but is also what sends us far beyond ourselves, meaning it sends us beyond what we think we already are. It sends us beyond our constituted subjectivity. Now, C causes uh, adoration, adoration, a gesture that receives and addresses, that welcomes and salutes. It is a gesture at once of attention to the singular and of reception of an incommensurable value. The, the, the attention to the singular, to this small little insect, this one here right now on my desk at this moment, and of course, the reception of the incommensural value of this very small thing, which is right here, right now, is a moment that cannot be repeated, ever. Our access to the world then appears where forces precede and follow us. Open quote, where forces are not concerned with the subject's calculation and projection, but where one might rather say that a subject, by welcoming these forces, by espousing their impetus, might have some chance of shaping itself. Origins and ultimate reasons cannot be checked, not by man, at least, or not by humanity, at least. But patience can be used as a power to access the world's suspense, the world's attractiveness. Now, C writes that it is, open quote, separation that renders this address or its refusal possible, close quote. And these, all these quotes are from Adoration, the book Adoration. This suspense is both reception and expression and reveals that the world is there in order to be taken to heart and released again. The world is, Nancy writes, nothing. And this nothing is reality and suffering. Open quote, what I am in the eyes of an attentive other, or what a form or color of a tree or tool is when I allow it to enter and go through me, not to remain before me. Close quote. This idea that the world goes through us and that we 
go through the world as opposed to standing in front of it is really key to begin understanding of Nancy's uh, philosophy. That the world is not a job, an object that stands in front of us, but that it relates to us and we relate to it in a very different way is a key idea for Nancy. The Heideggerian providence of this passage, of the passage that I've just read, is difficult to deny. Heidegger writes that the thing, open quote, that matters foremost is for once to let the tree stand where it stands. To this day, thought has never let the tree stand where it stands. Heidegger says, to this day, human thinking philosophy has never allowed the tree to just stand where it should stand or where it does stand. So let's forget about mastery being, we haven't even been able to allow a tree to stand in its place. This is Heidegger's damning judgment of Western thinking. To this day, thought has never let a tree stand where it stands. Again, this gesture happens outside philosophy as it is now. If it is not philosophy, this is nonetheless what philosophy is in need of to open itself up to our ability to be affected and to open to affect in general, open quote again from Nancy, a receptivity, passivity, or capacity for sensation that must already be given and given or as already open in order for something like affection to take place. This is a definition of affect that Nancy gives us is that obviously we stand before emotion but that makes, of course, all other sensations possible. Thinking takes his revolution from here. It is not the absorption of what affects it. Thinking is not the absorption of what causes it and sets it in motion. Not the reduction, but a powerlessness, an ability to receive and unleash what surpasses us. What surpasses thinking is not a more powerful being, a more perfect substance or a unique principle or a one principle, but the very force that activates it and the thinking itself then puts into place. So what surpasses thinking is not uh, another reason, the reason of an other world, but precisely this force that activates thinking at the same time and the thinking cannot contain. So we're set to think by something that is also bigger than thinking. As well. When thinking abandons the position of a subject facing an object and allows itself to welcome the unique value of the singular, then thinking opens itself to what releases it. And here, of course, one has in mind, children don't see being singular plural as a text that does attempt precisely. The condition for thinking then becomes the patient shown to this anteriority and this the one who adores addresses only by way of a response. Open quote. Speech that somehow responds only to itself, to its own opening, to the possibility given within language of going to the limit of significations and as far as silence. So silence could in itself be a response of a certain kind. It is not therefore the gesture the one enacts, but the gesture the one is carried into. The force of the world without reference and without reason throws me, presses itself onto me and forces me. Now C writes that the world, open quote, forces me to be inclined towards, m'oblige à m'incliner. It pushes me, forces me to incline, so to, to lean towards something to lend an ear, to, to become attentive, to, to, to be sensitive to something. The term sancliné, indicate, to, to, to incline towards something, to be inclined towards something, indicates, of course, the act of bowing, bowing of tilting the head in deference or in salute, but also mean to invite, to solicit, to influence, to dispose to, uh, and to be disposed to. I'm inclined to do this. I'm inclined towards a certain course of action. Uh, I have an inclination for a certain type of thing. 
music, poetry, jogging or whatever. The world's force is such that it imposes on me not authority, but a responsibility for sense. So it's not that thinking does not give me the authority to say certain things, but bestows upon me the responsibility for sense, that I contribute to it. We are obliged to sense, to sense making, but it takes patience to sustain this responsibility because it is not one that can be exhausted or spent. The responsibility is such that at any moment I am called to respond again, to be lively to the world in order to match its liveliness, its fortuity, and its independence. Its independence also from thinking, from philosophy. And here one could open, I think, a whole I'm not going to do it here, and I'm not competent to do it, but one could open here a whole link between Jean-Luc Nancy and say what well, these days is called environmental thought or eco-politics, because there's a whole idea in Nancy, which I think he inherits from Heidegger, that would lead precisely to allow us to really rethink our relation to the world, which is mainly based on extraction from it. And we extract resources and, and things that we can't put back, which could, leads to climate change and potential to extinction. But there is in Nancy really a tracing of the steps as to how we got to this relationship to the world and how we can get out of it. So for those of you who want to pursue this avenue of Nancy as an eco-thinker, I think there are enough elements there to, to be doing this kind of work. It is not more control than one needs. It is not more control than one than the reason needs, not more mastery, but a power of patience. This power is, open quote, the condition of being abandoned to a fortuitous world, not renouncing our impetus, our desire, without thinking that we can satiate it either or exhaust it either, accepting that this always opens up anew. Patience defers satisfaction, closure, completion, satiation, but it leaves us with an appetite, a willingness to be open, to rejoice our loss of authority, to rejoice in the fact that the world cannot be grasped with our hands, and yet is never beyond the reach of our response. The world cannot be grasped with our hands. We cannot have it all, and yet, it is never too far for us to respond to it. To salute the day, knowing that it will not bring a truth, but continually defer truth itself, exceed it. Too much that is exactly the truth, as Nancy says in his email. We address what addresses us and addresses us in such a way that it inclines us towards a responsibility for the whole world not in the sense of a humanitarian or charitable work or philanthropic action, at least not just that, but in the sense that we are invested with a force that presses us to regard the world as the invaluable value that we can't master. Nancy writes, open quote, do not the morning sun, the plant pushing out of the soil, address a salut to us, a salutation to us, or the gaze of an animal? And for us, how do we salute one another? Close quote. You see in here this reference into the, to the, the plant pushing out of the soil or the morning sun, this the smallest thing of the absolute realism that I was talking about, singular and yet uh, incommensurable, or singular as a consequence incommensurable. The address is always to us, to each one of us, and to each one in a different way. It, if, it is a different world that calls each of us, and yet it is always the world and nothing else, not a thing. A call to patience at every step. If we don't respond, if, or if we respond too quickly, setting, settling the matter as if the world was just another matter to settle, then we're left worldless and we're left without thinking. Philosophy vacillates, moves between. Too quick and reductive a response and no response at all. Wanting to return to its own problems, 
admitting no distraction, unaware that it is this very concentration that distracts itself from what it allows it to work. It allows its work to begin in the first place. That is, a sense outside of determined, qualified and quantified sense. Too much. That is exactly the truth. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hugo. We were all wrapped in attention uh, by your extremely uh, and quite ironically thought-provoking lecture, should I say, uh, because you were, you know, like speaking basically about thinking and the limits to thinking and the different modalities of thinking, so on and so forth. Um, are there any questions uh, so far? We, we welcome questions uh, based on this talk. You might posit them in the chat box. You might directly ask Dr. Hugo if you have any uh, from the audience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sudip Paul. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hugo, for your insightful talk. Uh, I have a question. Uh, am I audible to you? Dr. Hugo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I've muted myself, but uh, okay. I can hear. So my question is, uh, what is uh, Jean-Luc Nossi's take on Heidegger's idea of being with, which is mid-same? Um, okay. Do you want me to address this straight away? I've kind of written a PhD on that, so it would take some time. Um, the mid sign, the mean with or the mid da sign, is um, one of Nancy's um, most, say, important legacy. Sorry, one of Heidegger's most important legacy for Nancy, because it is a term that Weiss Nancy uses a references explicitly, only sparingly, structures, in my view, um, a lot of his thinking. So, in order to answer this question, I think we need to um, we need a twofold response. On the one hand, of course, for Heidegger has often been described um, as a kind of, if I can coin a, an awkward term here a philosopher of, of individuality, of, of individual existence. But of course, in Heidegger, um, we very much are born among other Daseins, among other beings, among others like us. And we are not just others like us, but we are constantly surrounded, say, by other presence. So there is a very strong, in my view, very, very strong relational element to Heidegger that is be read less often than um, than other approaches. So, for instance, what Emmanuel Levinas to say, what, one of the greatest readers of Heidegger, what Emmanuel Levinas contests to Heidegger is that Heidegger has no regard for otherness, for the other. Now, see the way recuperates this this unthought, if you want, in Heidegger, this, this element of Heidegger, and says, no, actually, uh, if, you, if you read being with as coming before being in itself, then you open up a, a, a kind of different ontology, an ontology where the relationality stands before subjectivity, which is, in a certain sense, what... Um, now, C does in being singular plural and uh, and in corpus, for instance, this kind of autobiographical uh, piece on 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 the body, so that we have that an ontology that is based on constantly being with and among others before we are with ourselves. So that for now, C we're constantly traversed by this otherness by this relationship, say, to the outside that breaks down this binary construct of inside and outside. And we're constituted there in relationality before we constitute ourselves in a relation of identity. Um, 
I mean, this would deserve a much longer answer. As I said, I wrote a book on this, so it clearly took me a long time to answer this question. But if it can be really seen in this triangulation between no, C, Levinas, and Heidegger, where on the one hand you have Levinas who says, no, Heidegger doesn't think the other. And on the other, Don C, who says, without saying it explicitly, but Heidegger helps us to think beginning with otherness, beginning with something else, which of course that is makes, makes possible the, the, the idea of the world that NLC has as that which we're constantly open to before we can close in upon ourselves. The key text here, apart from being in time, in Heidegger, for instance, uh, would be identity and difference, where there is a reading uh, of, of course, identity and difference with reference to Hegel, uh, that is particularly convincing in making this, uh, for me, in making this argument of Heidegger as someone who can think relationality and can think otherness before uh, individual subjectivity. I hope this answers your question, but yeah. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Hugo, for your answer. Uh, we, we have another question in the chat box. Yes, Dr. Rugo, if you could uh, have a look at the chat box, I think there's a question for you. Yes, yes. So the question, uh, you can all see it, but I'll read it out just. If to think, uh, Nizarga, thank you very much for the question. If to, if to think is to open up, entertain a world at heart. Is there not a risk involved in this form of thinking? Yes, this is a very risky form of thinking. And, and I'll see that say, you know, to a certain extent also Heidegger, unless we're willing to take this risk, we're not thinking at all. There's a whole tradition really of uh, Western philosophy, French and German in particular, which uh, takes thinking to be a, a, a form of uh, risk and that in a way thinking you see this very well for instance in Blanchot, uh, in Bataille and, and others um, of that school but thinking is a form of risk taking it, there is no way no thinking that is um, settled because thinking is a constant agitation and so unless we are willing to accept this risk, but also the acknowledgement, which is in itself shattering, that uh, the world is not ours to have, and that the world is not something whose mastery we will ever realize. Unless we do that for no, Sima, for Heidegger as well, we do not think. Now, what is the payback for this is that we rejoice in the world more often. You know, if you think Don C writes a book called Adoration, then of course adoration is, is on the one hand a Christian term, because that's what you do vis-a-vis, -vis, say, um, an image of the divine or an icon or sort of it. But for him, it's also a more general attitude towards the world. That yes, I might not explain the some everything to myself, but I can enjoy this encounter nonetheless even or because the knowledge that uh, an ultimate reduction of this moment to knowledge will, will surpass me, will fails me. So yes, there is definitely a risk, uh, but for them, there is no thinking without this element of risk. That's also why Don C risks philosophical language. If you look at Don C's prose, whether you read it in English in, or in its original French, it's a very risky prose, where at times you have the sense that actually there is no argument left, I mean, that is proceeding in a different technique, call it poetry or something else is happening, is a, is a, is a prose that is not traditionally philosophical. So the risk that you take in terms of concept is also a risk that you have to take in how you construct your philosophical language. Derrida is probably something similar. Thank you, Dr. Rigo, for that. Uh, any other questions, observations, or comments, if any? Uh, you're welcome, all of our virtual listeners today. Right. Uh, 
Dr. Ryugo, I have a, a very brief, you know, like you might call it a question of sorts, but also a kind of a, a personal inquisition or a query uh, would be a better term. And that is this, that, you know, this talk is organized by the Center for Research in the Post-Humanities, uh, Bakura University, and uh, me and Shukhendu, we run it. Uh, and uh, I'm very interested to kind of, you know, uh, know from, you know, your side that uh, your talk was, you know, majorly predicated on, uh, you know, uh, Nancy's take on Heidegger and, and the entire, you know, like, uh, a kind of a majoritarian control that Heidegger had had over Western thought in general for a very long period of time. Now, uh, I want to know that, you know, like uh, Heidegger's uh, prominence in this regard basically comes from that, you know, replacement of Cartesianism with uh, the idea of the sign. And of course, your talk uh, projected the, the prominence and uh, the kind of, you know, uh, presence of different kinds of, you know, relational ontologies or multivalent ontologies as possible. So uh, when, you know, Heidegger kind of uh, posits this idea of being centric ontology, which kind of, you know, replaces the human as the center and may be said to be a sort of a foundational idea of uh, the post-human enterprise. Uh, what would be Nancy's, uh, you know, kind of position on that or take on that, if if you could uh, illustrate that from a, a post-humanist angle, if you might, you know, like. Um, this is a very interesting question and something that certainly I, I recognize that there is in Heidegger a post-humanist thought very strongly. Uh, and that is really, in a way, the one, because he's the one who then gives rise to all sorts of readings of humanism, as the human, he's really the one who then allows a whole post-humanist thinking that emerges already in the 60s and 70s in France to emerge and play out in different ways. What would be Nancy's post-humanist thought? I think the, the, the major contribution of this, so Nancy does not necessarily talk in terms of the non-human or the post-human uh, in the way that, say, Braidotti would do or, or other philosophers, say, of technology could do. He doesn't necessarily speak in these terms. But I think it's very clear that this is the direction it's moving into. And the greatest say, philosophical contribution to the project for me is that Nancy really does away as much as he can with the one principle as the goal of philosophy. And he does that mainly by, say, attacking or confronting monotheism. Monotheism as a school of thought that um, Nancy says is in a way proper of Plato already, when Plato inaugurates his idea of Etzeon, the God, and then of course into Christianity, and then from Christianity into the Enlightenment and the rationalist philosophies of uh, the, uh, the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. Um, for Nancy, the, the monotheistic logic, so the logic of the one principle, has never abandoned us. And in a way, he says, as long as we keep that as the horizon of our philosophy, we cannot move in an era where um, multiple agents of sense equally contribute to the world. This would be my answer, which for me is the, say, the... the I've actually written a, um, an encyclopedia entry for posthumanism recently for Oxford University Press. And one of, for me, the main idea of posthumanism, from my point of view, is precisely there are multiple agents of thinking. The thinking is multi agents, and these agents might have nothing to do with a human. It might be an octopus, to cite the most common example. Um, 
but that you know a flower as a, as, a, as a thinking or a sensation a sensitivity of itself but unless we move philosophy away from this idea of the ultimate principle we cannot make room for a posthuman thinking this is what i think nancy's contribution could be because if you go around and look for nancy for the term posthumanity in or, or non-humanity or Known anthropocentric in Nancy, you'll find very few references because he's not someone who thematizes this in particularly explicitly, but he's nonetheless a clear contributor to this understanding. He's already living in that thought, in the posthuman thought, for sure. Right. Uh, I think we have another question, a slightly longish, longish question I can see in the chat box. Dr. Rugo, if you could respond to that. So is there a, the concept of otherization closely related with the othering, otherizing nature by William Cronin? That means nature appears to be the other of humans in this book, Uncommon Ground Rethink. So I have to say, I do not, I'm not particularly familiar with this work, so I don't know if I can uh, adequately answer your question, um, a meaning that I've not I know the work, but it's not work I have been able to think with. Um, for Nancy, the question of otherness is dislodged from the idea that there is a one thinking subject which confronts an otherness that stands in front of him. Existence is right. otherness. Existence is otherness because the, what sets it in motion what may manifest it manifests itself as otherness as relations of otherness relations that are outside of a self or rather selves that are always completely outside now see it does not in and of itself say much to my recollection it might be wrong i might be wrong about nature itself or the human and nature, but the, the same answer that I gave before about the posthuman is probably something that Nancy would uh, embrace about nature as well. So maybe a more Spinozian understanding of nature, uh, or rather the divine and nature, and as 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 a system of modes and of articulations, where nature itself cannot be a final principle or a settled identity but is caught in a negotiation itself caught in processing in processes of otherness. I, I understand my answer to this question is limited and rather vague, but I would have to reflect a little more on this particular text to be able to give you a, a more specific answer. Right, uh, Dr. Hugo, I'm sure there would be an occasion for that and a correspondence would definitely be uh, coming from our end. I think, uh, a particular respondent has raised his hand. Uh, Debojoti Dan, are you there? And if you are there, would you very briefly pose it your question? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm there. Uh, um, sir, uh, my question is like, uh, you spoke uh, at length on Heidegger and uh, I just uh, wanted to uh, ask you about the intentionality and the referentiality and the problem of referentiality in Husserl's Zeitdenken in the framework of Husserl's phenomenology and intentionality. Sorry, I'm writing down the question. So you, what, your question relates to referentiality in- uh, Intentionality Husserl. and referentiality and the problem of referentiality in Husserl's Zeit Denken in the, in the framework of Husserl's phenomenology. So I have to approach this from, from Nancy's side, given that this was a talk on Nancy. The, Nancy, in a way, moves away from the quest, from the problems of the referentiality because he tries to move away from, so I'll give you a very indirect answer. It tries to move away from a phenomenological approach. So on the one hand, Nancy is... Um, educated into phenomenology or into philosophy through a phenomenological point of view. But he very much embraces, in my view at least, 
um, and the Heideggerian critique of phenomenology. And certainly, as I think it was apparent, uh, the, the idea of the phenomenological reduction is something that Nancy really moves away from. So if he maintains something of phenomenology as in terms of experiential terms, in terms of the experience, it certainly stops at some point and probably stops precisely at the referentiality that you're referring to, to move into a different direction. And this is the direction where we cannot arrive any form of reduction because of the excessive nature of sense that I was that I was talking about. So I know this is not an, a direct answer to your question, but I kind of try to keep it with uh, with Nancy. Also because I think it would require a much longer and detailed explanation. Um, there are things of Husserl that survive in Nancy, but there is also this size move away from all of the phenomenological framework, even the one that is still, of course, indebted to Husserl, but which is quite far from it, of Merleau-Ponty, which you would imagine, and Derrida writes about this, as being the closest to Nancy because of the questions of corporeality and so on and so forth. And actually, this allows me to connect to the other question by Jaspal, who's asking, is there any reflection of the Redian thought in Nancy's epistemology? Yeah, I mean, uh, there is a lot of Derrida in Nancy, and at times you almost have the impression that the two thoughts touch each other, coincide in certain things. There's a certain prose in Nancy that is very Derridian. Um, but, uh, but where, for instance, Derrida would be much more keen on avoiding ontological, explicitly ontological questions, or of using the term ontology. Of course, for Nancy, this is uh, not as, as difficult a term to work with. So he does refer to ontology, refers to being uh, in a way that would not be done by Derrida. Derrida has written a, a book on Nancy, which is called On Touching Jean-Luc Nancy, Les Touches Jean-Luc Nancy, um, which is very helpful to show both the commonalities and the distance between the two. I hope this addressed your question. Right. Uh... Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Hugo. There were a lot of questions. Didn't expect that, you know, uh, it would be such thought provoking from every point of view. I don't think there are any more questions as such. Uh, yes, that's the uh, position. But uh, thank you for your deliberation. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. And uh, it, yeah, it was, it was really a pleasure to host you. Shukandu and I definitely agree on this. And we would definitely love to have you uh, physically in our university someday, uh, if no, opportunity, no. time, and scope permit. And uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor sends you his regards. He has been a bit engaged of late due to several works. And uh, uh, we also extend our heartfelt gratitude to you for this. Uh, so now I uh, pass on uh, to uh, Shukendu. Shukendu, if you could uh, you know, uh, introduce a formal vote of thanks. Over to you, Shukandu. Thank you, Dr. Yugo, uh, for your insightful uh, talk. And uh, I wish this could go on a few, few more hours. Uh, we would like to get in touch with you. Uh, if you ever uh, come to India, please don't forget uh, to inform us. We would be uh, very happy to host you in person to our university. You always have standing invitation. Uh, to our university and I would like to thank our audience uh, for joining us and as Daniel Rugo was talking I forgot to mention one thing that Dr. Rugo's book Jean-Luc Norsi and the Thinking of Otherness is available on Amazon it has been published in 2013 I have just started reading this book it is such a uh, pleasant reading so I would humbly request our audience, if they are interested, 
they may buy this book from Amazon or insert. So with this note, I formally end today's session. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rugo, for being with us and for your insight. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for the questions and for your attention. Very generous. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.